working a little bit less winds up making everybody more productive, right? Which, which again, we don't think. We think it's like number of hours at your desk is going to somehow predict like how much output you have. But like we are not machines as much as we'd like to think we are. So let's talk about uh, compensation, because in all of the, the research that you see externally, but we do extensive surveying of, of job seekers uh, all the time. And that consistently comes up as one of the top reasons that people look for a new job. Um, you've talked about the fact that that might or might not actually uh, be correlated with happiness and therefore might or might not be the best strategy. What does your research show? Salary matters if you're not making very much. If you're like living below the poverty line, you know, if you're not making enough to kind of have a reasonable existence where you feel kind of safe and secure, definitely getting more money matters a lot. And if you're in that situation, yes, you should switch jobs. You'll be much happier. But I think a lot of us are kind of, you know, know that relationship probably exists at really low incomes and we extrapolate it out past when it's when it continues to matter and continues to matter these days. There's evidence, at least from a 2009 study, but if you're earning over 75K in the US right now, then doubling or tripling your salary won't matter at all for your levels of stress, for your levels of positive emotion, and so on. It's not what we think, but it's what the data really show. And you know, 75K in 2009, maybe it's a little bit more now, but it's not the level that we think. Um, in fact, if you looked at the kinds of compensation that really do matter for people's happiness, it's things like giving people back access to a little bit more time. While there's not really that much evidence that wealth affluence, like monetary affluence, boosts our happiness, there's a lot of evidence that time affluence, this is this term that social scientists use, really matters for our happiness. And the opposite feeling, what this term I used before, time famine, where you're like, feel like you're starving for time, you're literally starving for time, that's a recipe for really like reduced well-being. I think we need to kind of get in the mode of, of realizing that, yes, you know, we have to you know, put food on the table, right? We have to earn a living, right? That matters and we should do that fairly and with living wages. But once we get past a certain point, it's kind of not going to matter that much for our lifestyle as we think. We have this uh, this sort of ladder that we climb, you know, going through middle school to get to high school, you get to high school, you get to college, maybe you do some graduate work and then you end up in work um, and then and then it never ends. Right. So hopefully for many people, there's an opportunity at work to to find your place in the world. And what is the role of work in happiness on, on both sides? Yeah, I mean, I think work can be an important spot for happiness, you know, in a lot of different ways. I mean, one, it just, it takes up a lot of our time, right? You know, it's going to be probably a third of our time, if not more, if you have sleeping and kind of out of time of work. And so if we're not maximizing our happiness there, that's just a lot of time lost just, you know, statistically in our lives. And there's lots of evidence that at work, you seem to enjoy the journey most if you're engaging in tasks that allow you to use what are known as your signature strengths. Um, what are signature strengths? Well, researchers go out and they look at like, what are the kinds of things people value? And they sort of think about like all kinds of like strengths that you can have that like, you know, might be good for the world, right? Like things like bravery or humor or creativity or like social, like social expertise and empathy or a love of learning, right? You can kind of probably kind of come up with some on your own of just like good, positive, valuable traits for people to have. Um, but it turns out that there's some of those traits that resonate particularly well with you. And there's evidence that if you use those strengths at work, if you find ways to infuse them into your normal job description, you wind up happier at work, you wind up performing better at work. Your managers will say, oh my gosh, you're doing so much better. But in addition, you start to not think of your job as a job or even a career, you start to think of it as a calling. You know, work-life balance is actually maybe not the best way to look at it, that you prefer to think of it as work-life harmony. Can you talk through that for the folks that haven't heard this and, and, and what, does that, what does that distinction mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there are kind of two problems with this idea of work-life balance, right? One is like, if you really think through the metaphor, you know, if you picture in your mind to balance, you kind of see like, you know, scales, like almost judges scales, you know, work over here, like life over here. And I think we get the implicit sense that like, you know, if we want to invest in work and work's going up, that, you know, the balance is kind of, well, the life balance is sort of going down. That's why I like this idea of, of work-life harmony rather than work-life balance. It's not a zero-sum game. If you invest in your mental health, if you are feeling better, you will work better too. We talk to our customers all the time and one of the things they look at and they say, gaps in a resume are a real problem or job hopping someone who moves around every couple of years as opposed to staying somewhere 
But if people are making these decisions for their own mental health and for creating more work-life harmony, what, what, if any, advice is there for how someone can navigate those conversations with a prospective employer about why their resume might include these gaps? Say you're in tech and you realize, like, I'm not trained enough in the latest technique of, you know, programming or R or whatever. I need to get some training to do that a little bit better, right? Like, that might be seen as a really good thing. Like, wow, you independently identified a spot where you needed to build your skill set up and you did that. I think we start, need to start thinking about mental health in the same way. This is not being weak. This is not like this. This actually is taking care of yourself in a way that will allow you to perform better. It matters for the bottom line that like rest and taking breaks and these kinds of things matter for increased performance later on. My hope is that, you know, soon, you know, as you look at somebody's resume, you're like, whoa, you took a couple months off to take a break. Like that shows me that you're not going to come here and get burned out and be a drain on my healthcare system and be a drain on what's happening. Like you took time off to protect yourself. You're coming back energized and that's who I want to hire. Dr. Lori Santos, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much for, for the work that you do in your research, which really, um, I think, uh, will help more and more people be more happy in whatever it is that they're doing. Thank you so much for having me on the show.